Welcome to Monday's edition of Renew Plus. I'm Pastor Tony. Thank you for joining us for another week in our series we've entitled Grace and Peace. In fact, this is week number six of our series. If you're just now joining us, of course, the things we're talking about are uh, do stand alone. But if you want to get the most out of it, at some point in time, go back and uh, catch up and listen to the things we've said the previous five weeks. And I know people binge watch all the time TV shows. It won't take you very long to catch up to where we are right now. I want to go back over to a scripture we left off last week, the end of last week with Gospel of John chapter 14. John, the 14th chapter. And this is an address that Jesus was giving to his disciples uh, right after he had celebrated the Passover with them. And uh, also, he instituted what we call the Lord's Supper or communion. And the significance of that is that he is bringing an end to the old covenant of law. He is fulfilling, he's about to fulfill all the covenant law. And he's about to institute for all of us a new covenant. Now, we've already looked at in previous uh, lessons in this particular series here on Grace and Peace, Isaiah chapter 54, and what Isaiah prophesied there in verse 9 and 10, Isaiah 54, 9 and 10, that this covenant, this new covenant that we're living in right now as believers is a covenant of peace. It is a covenant of peace. Now, we could refer to it as a lot of different things, <clears throat> but, Jesus, but the prophet entitled that, this new covenant, as a covenant of of peace. And under that new covenant, this new covenant, this covenant of peace that God made with all of us through Jesus, His Son, through His finished work, uh, he, he said, He uh, promised with a sworn oath, He said, I will not be angry with you nor rebuke you again. Now that word rebuke could also be translated condemn. He's not, he is going to correct those He loves, but He's not going to condemn us in the process. But he swore with an oath that he would not be angry with us. Now why is that? Because he poured out all of his anger and wrath upon his son Jesus when he was lifted up on the cross. You have to remember, Jesus became uh, sin for us. Not He wasn't up there suffering for his own sin. He was suffering as our substitute and our sacrifice, becoming sin, identifying with us and our sin in the fall of man. And when he did that, lifted up on the cross... God poured all of His wrath, all the judgment, all the punishment, the curse, the condemnation out on His Son once and once for all. And so that's why we enter into a new covenant, and it is a covenant of peace. That's why God swore that He's not going to be angry with us. He's not going to be, we're not going to experience His wrath any longer because Jesus tasted the wrath of God, the anger, the, the, the condemnation for all of us on that cross for all times for all per people and so now we're we have entered into a new covenant and so Jesus right here is preparing his disciples first of all for his going to the cross to become sin for us and we we're looking past tense on that right now second of all he's he's preparing all of us for this new covenant now what's indicative of the new covenant was well, peace but why is it peace with God because Jesus removed sin from all of our life. He did away with sin in our life. Our sins have been completely forgiven, completely cleansed, just as if they never even happened. That's how perfect, complete, and what a finished work Jesus did in His death, burial, and resurrection. So He's preparing His disciples for that, but He's also speaking to us about these things. And I want you to see this right here in verse 27. Jesus is talking, he said, peace, I leave with you. Peace, I leave with you. He says, my peace, I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Now, let's stop right there. Notice, Jesus left us as an inheritance, as a free gift, his own peace. Now, he makes a distinction here, and we talked about this at the end of last week, but he makes a distinction here between his peace, the Jesus kind of peace, the God kind of peace, and the pseudo peace that the world offers. Now, what's the difference here? Well, 
The world's peace is based on external circumstances. It's primarily a feeling or an emotion. It is very fragile, it's fleeting, it's temporary. It's going to be here one minute, gone the next, because it's all based on ever-changing external circumstances, conditions, and feelings and emotions. We all know about those. That, you know, if you're, if you're riding that roller coaster, you're going to be up one day and down the next. And see, that's the way the world operates. It world, it, the world's idea of peace is, you know, some kind of a substitute, a pseudo peace. It's not really even a peace in that sense at all. It's just this temporary feeling or emotion that people get that everything right now is going pretty good. I'm, I'm not, I, there's an absence of trouble in my life, an absence of problems, absence of wars, absence of conflict in my life and how many of you know that that's not going to last very long that's why the world in their idea of peace their expectation their hope is very fleeting and fragile in other words when things are going good they're expecting the other shoe to drop they're expecting something bad to happen on the horizon because you know we got to pay for the good times we got to pay for this this you know temporary period of 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 peace in our life but that's not the peace that, that God provides. That's not the peace of Jesus that he left to all of us. Not just his disciples. This is the peace of this new covenant. This is a everlasting covenant. There's not going to be anything to replace it because it's perfect. It's between God the Father and Jesus the Son. So this peace is not fragile, fleeting, and temporary. It is eternal. And it's not based on external things. It's based on internal things. It's based on our in our relationship, our right relationship with God. Because sin has been removed from uh, our, between us and God, that's why the angels were proclaiming, as we looked at the first week, into, a week or two, the angels were proclaiming to the shepherd at the first advent of Jesus when he was born, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Now, he, again, he wasn't telling us all and exhorting us all to get in peace with one another down here and get along with everybody. Of course, that's good. That's not where it starts. Our peace uh, horizontally starts with peace vertically with God. And see, once we're at peace with God, once we're in a right relationship with the Most High God, then we can be at peace in our circumstances, even when they're negative, even when we have adversity going on in our life, pressures happening, even when people don't like you, you can still operate and walk in a, an eternal, unchanging peace because I'm right with God because of the finished work of Jesus. And see, that's what he's telling them and he's telling us right here. He says, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And then he says this, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now this is our responsibility, the understood subject of that statement right there is you or or us this is not something that god can do for you this is something in our realm of responsibility he says let not your heart be troubled in other words do not allow or let troubles externally to become internal troubles and steal and rob you of that walk of peace in your life now those external problems and situations are not an indication that we're not at, in right relationship or at peace with God. It, this, these are things that the enemy brings, the adversary brings into your life. And we talked about this last week, and we're going to continue along this line this week. But the adversary, the enemy, and that is the devil if you don't know who he is, he is the one who is against you. God is for you as believers. The enemy, the adversary, the devil, is trying to work against you. But he's not wanting just to stay on the outside. He's not just wanting just to give you a hard time in life and bring some trouble into your life externally. His ultimate purpose for that is to get inside of your heart. To get the trouble on the outside to become a trouble on the inside. And remember last week, and I'm doing this in review, but I think it's good for us as this really helps establish us in some of these things. But this word troubled right here, when he says, let not your heart be troubled, is defined as meaning to agitate, 
See, he wants to bring trouble on the inside and agitate, keep you stirred up. And that's another synonym or definition for this word trouble is to stir up. He wants to keep you stirred up on the inside and agitated all the time. It also means to disturb. He wants to disturb your peace. It also means to disquiet or to cause distress and to make restless. I want you to notice that right there. What does God want you to do? He wants you to enter in and walk in His rest. What does the enemy want to do? He wants to steal your peace and make you restless. But I also like this particular definition that I gave you last week. It is actually a whole sentence. It, uh, this definition says to be troubled means to perplex one's mind by suggesting doubts. To, to perplex one's mind by suggesting doubts. See, this is really what trouble in the heart is. It's doubts about God's love for you. It's doubts concerning the finished work of Jesus and what the blood of Jesus did in our sins. See, the enemy wants to bring doubts whether, whether you're still in right relationship with God. He wants to bring a doubt into your mind where God is really good. Maybe He's withholding something good from you. See, it's the same lies that He used on Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know, before they ever partook of that forbidden tree, He had to get inside of their heart. He had to start creating doubts on the inside of them concerning the character and the nature, the goodness and the love of God. And, you know, remember what He said about that, and this is Genesis chapter 3, and I may be paraphrasing this just a little bit, but he, he questioned them and put a doubt in them, questioning that the fact that God knows that the day that you eat of that forbidden tree, you're going to be like him. In other words, he's, he's insecure. He's, he's jealous. He didn't want you becoming uh, like him. Well, the fact is, God had already created them in his likeness and in his image. That's reality and truth. Now, he got them to question, first of all, God's goodness. In other words, God's withholding something good from you that's going to make your life better. So you're going to have to do something about that. You're going to have to take your life in your own hands. You're going to have to take the care for your future and, and, and becoming all that you can be into your own hands and you work it out. And see, that is self-righteousness. And I'll tell you, that will... That will move you out of rest and move you out of the peace of God. And that is not a good place to be. So see, what he's trying to do is bring doubts. He's trying to question, what are you going to do about this now? What are you going to do about this situation? You know, and he'll suggest that God, you know, you've done something to make God mad. Well, we already found out part of this new covenant. He sworn that he would not be angry with you. Why? Because he's looking at the finished work of Jesus. He's looking at you through the blood of Jesus. He's looking at you in Christ. He's not looking at you apart from Christ anymore. And see, that's why he's not angry with you anymore. Plus, it would be double jeopardy for him to pour out his wrath on you after he poured it all out on Jesus on the cross. So, see, this is what we need to deal with. Let not your heart be troubled. In other words, don't let the, the, the trouble on the outside trouble your heart on the inside by beginning to entertain doubts that are associated with the devil's lies, his deceptions, and those negative adverse circumstances that are going on on the outside of you. Now, we also read, and let's go back over there real quick because this ties right into this, in uh, Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs, the fourth chapter. And notice verse 23. Proverbs 4, verse 23. It says, Keep your heart with all diligence. Notice this. Keep your heart. Now, that, that word keep can also be translated or defined as meaning guarded. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Notice where the flow or the issues of life are coming from. Your life is not determined by what's going on on the outside. Your life is ultimately determined by what's coming from the inside and working out. And see, he wants uh, the enemy wants you it wants to steal your peace, rob you of that rest, the rest of God, present you with all kind of doubts and questions in your own mind and heart 
that would perplex your mind and get you troubled, agitated, disturbed, and restless on the inside. And see, but what is the instructions here? Well, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. The, the, the writer of Proverbs says, keep or guard your heart with all diligence. Now, why does it say all diligence? Because, uh, let me tell you something, you're constantly going to be inundated from the outside in with pressures, negative circumstances, opinions of others, you know, people don't like you, people are going to give you a bad opinion, words of others that are not in line with God and what He said in His Word. And so if you allow those in, and they take the throne of your heart, then you're not going to walk a, a, a life of peace and rest. And see, this is all in context of us keeping in the midst of our heart God's Word. God's Word must be on the, in the midst of your heart. If God's Word is in the midst of your heart, on the throne of your life, on the throne of your heart, then your heart is not going to be susceptible to allowing troubles to come in, questions and doubts to come in. <clears throat> That's why our relationship with the Word must be established, stable, and solid. Okay, that's all the time I've got for today. Man, my time went by really quick today. If you'd like additional materials, resources, information, go to TonyCowan.org and check us again. We'll see you tomorrow.